Last week I was at Gen Con 2014 and I picked up many games, one of which being Abyss. This was a game that was attracting a lot of attention, so I tried among the games that I picked up there. This is one of the first ones that I tried. I played it there, I played it after that, um, and I enjoyed it. I can already anticipate that. I think this is a nice game. Uh, it has several variant covers. I picked up uh, the coolest one, the one with the grumpy unicorn fish lady. I like her. Uh, the art is really good, by the way, this is not the only nice looking part of the game. Abyss is a game of world domination, well not all of the world, just the part under the sea. Uh, it is set among the people of the sea, mermaids, tritons, jellyfish people, strange hybrids between uh, anthropomorphic creatures and submarine life forms. And these creatures are uh, scheming and manipulating and do and using political means uh, of the world under the sea and other other means of various nature to achieve control to control lands. So you're one of these uber lords uh, of the of the sea and you're trying to control people of the council of the sea, local lords to control lands. There's a lot of this thing, a lot of these things that are going on uh, through what is actually a very simple, very linear uh, set of rules. Uh, very, very lean core of rules, and yet at the same time, these rules do result in some strategy, and there's quite some depth no pun intended when talking about the, the sea and the ocean. Uh, there's some depth that can be appreciated only uh, through gameplay. Let me show you how the game looks once you set it up, let me tell about the main uh, mechanics of the game and then I'll share with you my impressions after playing Abyss by Asmodee. This is the board of the game where you can see the game at setup ready to start. Uh, the board is divided in three areas. An area up there which is used for explorations, to explore the depths. An area representing the council of the sea creatures. It looks like these people just went to the movie theater or to a sport event. Uh, but just kidding. Uh, the art is very pleasant, it's very atmospheric. I like it. I like the colors especially. And here you have an area where you place cards representing the lords that you will recruit during the game to take control of the depths of the sea. During your turn you can do one of three things. One thing that you will do very often is to explore the depths. When you do that you simply flip the first card from this deck and you place it face up in the first space there. These cards represent animals of the sea <clears throat> These animals are associated with colors such as red, purple, um, blue, green, there's also yellow, and these animals have numbers. So you flip the first card that you drew from the deck, you put it there. It is your turn, but everybody else in the game gets a chance to get that card before you do. That is, you need to offer that card to the other players. And the other players can buy it from you for pearls. So pearls are one of the two forms of currency in the game. Each player will have a shell such as this one to keep, uh, to, to hold their pearls. Very smart idea, so that the pearls don't run around the table. And so when you flip the card, you offer it to the other players. Um, a player, that is not you, a non-active player, can choose to buy it and the first card that is bought in this form is worth one pearl. The opponent will have to give you one pearl. So suppose that the opponent buys the pearl, buys that card for the pearl, then you simply repeat the procedure, you flip another card, now we have this creature here, 41, and then you offer it to the players who have not bought anything yet. Uh, Non-active players can purchase only one card per turn. Suppose nobody wants it, then you keep drawing. Nobody wants that card. You keep drawing. Nobody wants that card, etc, etc, etc. Each time that you offer a card to one of your opponents and nobody buys it, you can get the card yourself. In that case, it is pretty simple. You simply grab the card and you add it to your hand. That means that during your turn, when you're exploring, you may get a chance of getting pearls from your opponents as they buy cards that you have found, or 
and or you will get a card for free which is the card where you decide to stop drawing. I said earlier that the opponent can buy cards from you, the first card that is bought in a turn is worth one pearl, the second card costs two pearls and the third card costs three pearls. So if you have three people buying cards from you as you're exploring the depth you will get a lot of pearls which is good. On the other hand that means that probably those cards are useful and good and players are buying them from you. That is they are getting those resources, they're giving you one type of resource and taking another one from you. Suppose that you keep drawing cards and players keep not buying them uh, and or in any case you keep drawing cards until you get to fill the last space of the track which pretty much can happen only if you don't buy if you don't pick up a card yourself until that point well when you fill up the last space of the track you do get the card that is there you have to take it and you also receive a pearl so that is a bonus that's an advantage another factor to keep in mind is that once this track has been used at the end of your turn that is when the active player has stopped drawing cards because he or she took an early card or simply filled up the hole the cards that have not been assigned are turned face down and they're placed in these areas here which are the areas of the council corresponding to the color so blue goes here blue goes here yellow goes here and this is supposedly the card that the player took home. These cards will be available later. There is however also another type of card that may come out of that deck and that is not one of these little animals with the number as we saw. The card that may come out is a sea monster. Ooh, what does that mean? When a sea monster is drawn you look at this track here which is the threat track and at the beginning uh, the token that indicates the level of threat coming from sea monsters is placed up there. When a sea monster is revealed uh, on the exploration track, the active player can choose to continue. Says, so, well, I want to keep exploring. In this case, you simply ignore the monster. It stays there. It stays there. You draw another card as usual. You keep drawing on those track on that track but if you ignore the monster and leave it there then the level of threat increases and you move that token by one you move the token by one each time a monster is encountered and the player keeps exploring another thing that you can do is when a monster is there to choose to defeat it it's automatic you simply declare that you defeat the monster uh, your turn is over but at that point you gain a resource you gain a bonus which is symbolically represented by the icons that are at the side of the present level of threat so if you decide to defeat a monster when the level of threat is there you get a key token which you will use later to take control of territories if it's here for example you get two keys if it's here you get a key plus either a pearl or a victory points token there's a pool of tokens uh, from which you draw randomly in certain occasions and each such token will give you two to four victory points at the end of the game when the active player decides to uh, defeat the available monster and gains uh, the reward for doing so then the, tra the threat track is reset to the beginning and you continue like this after the exploration phase monsters are discarded another thing that you can do is to seek the help of the council as i said earlier as the game progresses there will be cards that will be stacked in these areas in these areas here the cards that are not used there will be placed here and they'll form little stacks uh, divided by colors what happens is that during your turn one of the things that you can do uh, is to seek the help of the council which is you choose one of these piles of any one color and you pick up all of the cards that are in there all the cards of one color in that area and you add them to your hand that simple you may gain a lot of cards in this way as you can see this also means that if the opponents left a lot of cards out because they always wanted to go for the pearl at the end of the track they they uh, they pushed a lot of cards into the council the council refills quickly and then when it is your turn you will be able to grab a lot of cards if 
that is what you want to do. And okay, we grab cards from the council, we grab cards from the depth of the ocean, but why do we do so? Because we are trying to gain influence, to gain power, to purchase lords, and lords um, in return will control lands for us. There is a deck of cards representing lords. Lords associated with colors, so you have purple, uh, green, red, blue, and each each uh, lord has an amount of influence points that the lord is worth at the end of the game. That is very important. That pretty much means victory point points. Some lords have keys and a lord of that type is worth in that regard as a key token. We'll talk about key tokens in a bit. Some lords may have powers printed at the bottom. Some powers have a black arrow which means that that's a one-time power that you activate as you acquire the lord. Some lords have powers that do not have that arrow. That means that the power is uh, is active as long as the Lord is active face up in front of the player. And here very important you have an air that tells you the cost of the Lord. The number of bubbles that you see here is the number of cards from your hand that you need to play to acquire that. Exactly that number. To acquire the Keeper you need exactly three cards. No one more, no one less. Also, uh, there, uh, there is usually a bubble that has a color, not always, but there is usually a color bubble. That means that among the cards required to acquire that uh, Lord, at least one has to be on that color. So to acquire the Seeker, I need two cards. I need to play exactly two cards. One of them has to be red. And the number here, well, the sum of the numbers printed on these cards has to be equal to or higher than the requirement for that Lord. For example, to purchase the Seeker, this would be a good combo because it is exactly two cards, one of them is red and the total of the numbers is seven. It may be that you have the right combination of cards but not enough points. The numbers do not add up to the final result that you need, then you can spend pearls. Each pearl is a numerical point that you can use to purchase a lord, but you still have to fulfill the requirements of the cards. Lords that you acquire are placed in front of you, and um, as I said, many of them will help you to control lands. When you have three keys in front of you, which may be from lords and or from token, tokens or any combinations, important thing is when you have three keys, automatically you can't uh, prevent that from happening, you acquire control of a land. Lands are represented by these large tiles here. They are placed in a stack face down, one is placed face up at the beginning of the game. When you acquire a land, you can get the land that is available, or you can draw one, two, three, or four tiles from the deck. Then you choose one, so if you chose to draw four, that's great, a lot of options for you. Problem is, the ones that you haven't chosen remain available for the other players. So, the more advantage you give to yourself, the more resources you leave out for the other players to explore. Once you have your terrain tile, or your location tile, you place it on the uh, play area, in the play area in front of you, at the bottom of the lords that you have used to control that, uh, that location. Now those lords are so busy ruling that area for you that they cannot use their powers anymore. The power print at the bottom of the lord card is covered, you can't use it until the end of the game. Now these lords are only good for influence points, that is victory points at the end of the game. The terrain tiles, the location tiles, also indicate uh, how many points you get at the end of the game for that location and also how you get those points. That is, different locations will give you victory points for different things. For example, the closed tower gives you three victory points for each of your lords with more or one keys. So, for example, if I only had these two lords in this style, the tile is worth six victory points because I had two lords with keys. This one is two points for each of your merchant lords. Lords are divided in categories. 
plus five points, two for each of your mage lords, soldier lords, um, each of your affiliated allies from the shellfish race. The affiliates, this is an important thing. When you use these cards to purchase lords, you discard most of them, but the card that you used with the lowest value you retain. Suppose I purchase a lord using these two cards, then this card is discarded, and then this one I uh, retain and I place in my play area. Uh, it's completely useless for now, it will only be used at the end of the game for victory points, for scoring. An interesting thing also, when players purchase lords, they can purchase any lord in that area, and when you purchase a lord, you slide the remaining ones to the right. Well, there will be a time where lords uh, are purchased, and the lord that is in this space will be purchased, revealing those symbols. The player that acquired that lord uh, will receive two pearls as an extra bonus. Also, as you're acquiring lords from this track, the track is not refilled immediately. It is refilled only when this card, the card in this space, is acquired. At that point, you draw cards from the lord deck and you refill that hole, you refill that area. In any case, you continue like this turn after turn with one of your three actions, seeking help from the council, drawing cards or acquiring lords, until either any player recruits their seventh lord or any player recruits a lord and then the deck of cards that should be here, that the lords come out from, is exhausted. At that point, players tally victory points, which are based on locations that players control, the lords that they have recruited, that is the influence points that the lords produce, the monster tokens, those victory point tokens that I mentioned earlier, such as this one, that are earned by players when they destroy monsters, not always, as some re possible rewards for killing monsters, and also players receive victory points for the strongest affiliated ally from each race, that is from each color. Suppose for example that at the end of the game I have these allies here, then I will score I will score three points from this guy because it's the only and therefore the strongest ally, affiliated ally that I have in the yellow category. I will score this guy for four points only and strongest. Here in the blue category, uh, suppose I recruit a three, black, uh, three uh, blue lords, and then I have three blue affiliates, I have a two or four, any one, the four I can score for four points, the other two are useless. You total together the victory points from all your four categories and at the point the player with the highest score is the winner. The game is very easy to learn and to teach. I mean, we took it out of the shrink wrap, uh, Gen Con, one evening, and we started uh, reading the rules and setting up the game and probably we were playing it within 20 minutes, a little over that, uh, from opening the box and none of the people in my group knew how to play the game. So, getting started with the game is not hard at all. Uh, there aren't many rules and they're not hard at all. What is much more complex and much more subtle, but it is also part of the fun, is to figure out the strategy behind those rules. It did take us most of the first game uh, to move from implementing the rules mechanically to seeing the implications of the rule, and in other words, figuring out what the heck we were doing, and uh, how to move from point A to point B, B being uh, the objectives that you're trying to achieve. We were doing stuff, getting resources, it just uh, it took us a while to picture things together, to paste things together and to realize, oh, this is the strategy. To move from the rules to the strategy was a little tricky, but when that happened, everybody was very pleased with the game. After we were done, we immediately started another game, people wanted to play it more, because once you start seeing the strategy behind this is a very appealing game. Uh, and the strategy behind has many elements that play into it and that make it interesting. Uh, one thing is that you're almost always involved uh, with the game and in the game. Uh, 
it is your turn, maybe you're exploring, then you want to see the cards that happen, you want to see what the players are going to do. Uh, the non-active players have a chance of buying stuff from you. And it's not just a, a simple decision for them uh, either. It's not just I'll get it or not get it. Even for the non-active player, there are elements of gambling and pushing your luck. Why so? Because there may be a certain resource that came out you want to buy from the active player. You think maybe it's great, maybe it's good, maybe not so great. I'll wait for a better one. But somebody else buys it, so then when the resource that you really want comes out, it's more expensive because the first resource is one pearl, two pearls, three pearls, and so on. Or it may be that then a better resource doesn't come out. So both the active player and the non-active players have to choose uh, have to choose their timing well, have to figure out when is the time to buy the right one, when may be the time to wait for a better resource, which may never show up. As long as you have pearls to purchase things, which will happen very often in the game for most of the time, uh, you are involved in every turn of the game, or almost every turn in the game, including the ones in which uh, you're not the active player. And it's really only the exploration turn that is long. If the other player uh, seeks the help of the council, that the player reaches the board, grabs a stack of cards, the turn is over. You're not involved in that turn, but it lasts three seconds. That's not going to generate any downtime. The same applies if the other player decides to buy a lord. The player buys a lord, puts it in front of himself. Maybe buys a land, puts that in front of himself. And if the other player makes a decision of leaving out tiles, that is interesting to you too. Even though you're not playing, you want to see the tiles that now have been made available. So the only part of the game that takes some time all, which is the exploration, always involves all or most players. This is absolutely great. Also, what I like here is the, I would say, the leading dilemma behind the design, which is you can choose to grab a lot of great resources that will give you a lot of advantages, but as I hinted earlier in my review, if you do so, uh, you're also leaving good resources on the board for other players. Or you can choose to be more conservative to get something good for you at the present time, maybe not the best of all possible worlds, but something that works for you, and at the same time you're also limited the resources resources that you're leaving out on the board for other players. You're helping yourself, you're also helping other people, you're helping yourself not so much, you're not giving advantages to other people. And this can be seen at many levels of the, of the game. Especially the exploration, you go for uh, a lot uh, of cards, you get pearls so selling your cards, you get a chance to get the card that you really want, you may get the two, you may get a pearl at the end of the track, and then there are a ton of animals uh, of possible followers that go in the council and other players uh, can take uh, can take advantage of. They can become huge resources. Um, it is a game also that, uh, different from other economic games of this type, is not particularly punitive. You can make a mistake and still win. Thinking back, I realized that even in the game that I won, I had made a couple of mistakes here and there, and that you can still come back. Another thing is that you do not really find yourself stuck. Even if you make a huge mistake, or because of your strategy you find yourself without any resources, you're far from being out of the game. This is great, uh, because blind allies in games really bother me when there's a player that uh, is sitting there but effectively can't do much. That's really annoying. You may fall behind in points and get a sense you're not going to win the game, but you can always do something. I like the mechanics of the game and I like how they result in a system of strategy that is, if you, if you want, disproportionately complex and deep. Complex not as in complicated, but complex as in having many angles and many factors that you need to take into account, that you can exploit your advantage, uh, that are fun and challenging to interact with. Abyss is, is a good game, it's a very good game, one that I enjoyed, one of the most fun, like pure fun games that I played in quite a bit. I'm extremely happy that I, that I picked it up at Gen Con 2014. I hope you give it a try, really a good game, just a lot of good aspects to it nothing worth mentioning in the design uh, that that bothered me. Good game, I had fun every time I played it, I have no reason to think that I will have less time playing it in the future, which I will do, playing it in the future.